Hello and welcome to this very special interview on money control. I'm Mahalakshmi and I have with me someone who has played a very important role in India's policy making over many, many years, Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia. Thank you so much, Dr. Aluwalia, for joining me. Oh, thank you for inviting me. First, let me start with an outside-in view of India. You know, foreign investors seem to believe that India's secular growth trajectory will now settle at a higher level than before. Do you think India's moment has finally arrived and the next decade will indeed belong to India? Well, that's a lot of questions. You started off by talking about uh, foreign investors. I mean, their primary concern is to judge whether India is going to do better than the rest of the world. I mean, they are deploying money and they look where to deploy it. I think there's no doubt that the Indian economy will grow faster certainly than the developed countries, I mean, that's been there for some time, might even grow faster than, will in fact grow faster than other emerging market economies. And I think the third thing is that earlier, uh, the outstanding success among emerging market economies was China. Now, China's slowing down and will slow down. I wouldn't call that, by the way, a failure, because, you know, China is now five times our per capita yeah. income. So it was scheduled to slow down. Maybe the slowing down is happening a bit suddenly. So looking at it from that point of view, it's a large economy and it's going to do better than the other emerging market economies. So naturally they're coming and putting money in here. Now whether it's India's moment, and that's really looking more long term, how much, how fast are we going to grow? Are we going to come up to expectations? That requires a more detailed assessment. I mean, I would hope that we come up to expectations because the fact of the matter is at the level of income that we have and the very legitimate expectations that people have that, you know, we should improve our levels of living, education, health, uh, conditions of living in the rural areas, in the urban areas. This is not going to happen if we don't accelerate our growth. Somewhere between 7 to 8 percent is what we ought to be aiming at. Whether we get there or not depends on the policies we follow and of course also on the state of the world. So when you say 7 to 8 percent, what is it really contingent on? You're saying what kind of policies we follow. What do you believe is sustainable with or without what you do? And what is it that we can attain and what will it take? Well, I haven't studied this in sufficient detail. I mean, after all, I'm a gentleman of leisure at the moment. But I put it roughly, uh, if I look around uh, thoughtful economists, you know, most of them feel that we've developed a certain momentum. Yeah. They also feel that we've developed a certain consensus on policy. Unfortunately, in a political situation which is polarized, no political person wants to say there's a consensus. Hmm. Because each person will say the other person is doing something completely wrong. But you know, if you're more interested in the message that India should give, hmm. I think the message we should give is that we have a strongly contested, contested democratic system in which our politicians fight with each other. Hmm. But underneath it all, there's a certain consensus on policy. Right. Because you know, if politicians are fighting about things which imply a complete disruption of policy, nobody in his right mind will invest in India. So what is that consensus? Hmm. I mean, I think there is a consensus across the political spectrum that we need high growth. I mean, nobody is saying that, you know, growth is bad and we yeah. shouldn't aim for it, etc. But then a lot, almost everybody is saying that growth should be inclusive. Yeah. I mean, inclusive growth was the UPA formula uh, sabka Saat, Sabka Vikas is the NDA formula, comes to the same thing. Okay. Yeah. So there's consensus on that. I think there's consensus that we need fiscal discipline. Yeah. Uh, it would be a different thing, by the way, if one political lot said uh, economic theory has changed, fiscal discipline is old fashioned. Yeah. That's not the case. Yeah. Everyone is saying we need, we're not doing it. Yeah. Neither the previous government nor this government has been able to achieve the objective, but at least as an objective, it's there, Being which pursued. is a kind of continuity of sorts. Um, there is a lot of consensus that growth is going to come from the private sector, whichever government you look at. Okay, So that's an important thing. Nobody is saying 
that you know, in order to expand manufacturing, we should set up public sector enterprises. So there is change. I think the, <clears throat> the extent of uh, commitment to liberalize the economy domestically, move in ease of doing business, improve infrastructure, these are cross-political. They're, oh. they're really not policies. Oh. They are, if you like, uh, aspirations. And we should judge each government or each political uh, group by whether they move that forward or not. And I think by and large, most people outside feel that in this area, we are moving forward, not nearly as much as we say or want, but we're moving forward. So that is what I think makes people feel that, look, India, you know, even at worst, is probably going to manage something between 5 and 6%, okay? I mean, that rules out major disaster, I mean, sort of low level of achievement, 5 to 6%. Better level of achievement probably could get to something over 7%. But I mean, the aspirations that we've raised in our own mind, I mean, for example, all this $10 trillion economy by 2030, uh, that calls for a growth rate even higher than 8%. Hmm. So really, if you're looking at the crystal ball, I think you need to look at which of these is going to be. But remember, whatever it is, it's going to be a lot better than most other developing countries. So if you're a foreign investor, it makes sense to get a piece of the action. But, uh, you know, even if you look at a good part of uh, this millennium, and, uh, there was always this belief that we will grow no matter what at 6% or so. So what foreign investors today are paying for is really this you know, more ambitious target of 8% growth plus. So, I'm not sure about that because, you know, if foreign investors think that the US is going to grow at 2% hmm. and Europe is maybe going to end up growing in not much better than, the, than that, and if China is going to grow at a little over 3%, hmm. and average developing countries are going to grow somewhere between 4% or maybe and India is going to grow at 6%. Even that's good enough? Yeah, that's good enough. Because remember, the amount of money they're bringing here is still very small. Mm. We're talking about 100 billion a year of FDI. That is actually peanuts, mm. given the total amount of money. If there, was an, if there was a move, a perception, that we are going to be in the 8% lead, you will get a flood more of money than you're getting. In fact, all the infrastructure that we want to build and all the climate change uh, investment that we need would be much more easily handled if 8% if was the underlying assumption uh, of people. So today, if you say the government does nothing and there is just going to be status quo, we could still achieve about 5 to 6%. I regret to say that that's true. I mean, 5 to 6 is, you know, when you say nothing, uh, doing nothing for a government is actually not such a disaster. Doing yeah. nothing means please don't make any more mistakes. Right. <laughs> don't let the fiscal deficit go uh, sky high. Don't let money supply expand too much. Carry on doing the infrastructure development at the rate it's happening, but not at a breathtaking pace. So yes, five to six percent will happen in my view. And what needs to be fixed to get to eight percent plus? Like well, you, said. you need to do a lot more in exactly these areas. That's point number one. I mean. So specifically, have, what would you say? Should it be more well, public I would investments? Say that if should, we could, uh, yeah, if we could believe that we are now, let's say on the fiscal, let's start with the fiscal. I don't put too much importance on the monetary because, you know, if the fiscal is under control, I think we can leave the Reserve Bank to do this little fiddling around of monetary policy here and there, and they're doing a quite a good job. Uh, if we could be sure that the fiscal deficit is now going to come down. Now remember, the fiscal deficit is not just the center's fiscal deficit. Yeah. It's the center and the states. states. And that, I mean, against a target we had of 5%. Yeah. If you go back, every five years we appoint a group of very wise people, most of whom are my friends, and they end up saying within three years, the combined fiscal deficit should go down to 5%. And they've been saying it for the last 10 years right. and it's remained around 9 to 10 percent, okay? <clears throat> so doing nothing means it'll carry on at 9 percent. Hmm. Not go to 12. Hmm. That's, that's very crucial. Hmm. Now, is it, can we say that it's going down? 
hmm. to something like 5%, both together, in the next three or four years. I mean, I think that would be a very major gain, but what would it take? The first thing that it would take is we have to reconcile ourselves between uh, the many demands that we have on expenditure. Now, if you just pull somebody out from the street who's done a little bit of economics and has read the Economic Times and the Business Standard uh, and asked them... And money control. And money control, indeed. Uh, and you ask them, you know, what should we do on expenditure? Promptly, they'll say that, you know, we need to increase expenditure on health and education, uh, maybe one and a half percent point more on health as a percent of GDP, maybe one percent more on education. They'll all say that we need to increase expenditure on R&D, hmm. especially on agricultural R&D, which is absolutely correct. Hmm. Because, you know, climate change is happening, hmm. uh, not because of what we're doing, but what the world is not doing. Hmm. So it makes sense for us to anticipate that uh, uh, temperatures are going to rise, drought frequency is going to increase, extreme events are going to increase, etc., etc. And that is going to mean a fall in agricultural productivity, which we can only counter by doing decent agricultural research. And we are not spending nearly as much on that as we should. And most people would say the government should add maybe 1% of GDP in various types of R&D activities. Almost certainly they will say that our present level of defense expenditure is simply not consistent with the kind of geopolitical situation that we face uh, and we need to increase it. Now we, we hear about various acquisitions and so on which is modernizing the defense services which is good but we need to feed that back into what does it mean for defense expenditure because yeah. remember defense pensions are very high anyway. Yeah. So if you were to say that we need to increase defense expenditure also by say half a percent of GDP and then there's this infrastructure. I mean, we need our trains to move faster, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Add another 1% of GDP, public expenditure, and more private. Now, all of that means that you're talking about adding maybe 5% of GDP on the expenditure side, okay? How do you get a reduction in the fiscal deficit from about yeah. 9 to 5, which is a 4 percentage point improvement? Why Which I think you are being extremely optimistic in even stating something like this because no, I, the finance minister said four and a half percent in three years last year. That's for the center. Well, now you're talking about states and center put together. So that yes. will be a humongous leap uh, to achieve in three to four years. Well, I, I had said four to five years, but yes, I mean, you're absolutely, I mean, these numbers, by the way, you could put them up on your money control board. And everybody who visits could be asked to modify them. You know, when I say we need one more percent of GDP on health, maybe it is 0 0.8 or 1.1. But whichever way you add it up, you will need 5% of GDP more hmm. on expenditure. Okay? Hmm. Hmm. Now, and you want to reduce the combined fiscal deficit by, let's say, 4 to 5% of GDP. Hmm. That means you need a fiscal turnaround of 10 percentage points of GDP. This can only come either through taxation or getting rid of useless expenditure or not so productive expenditure. That is a big challenge. Hmm. Uh, I, I mean, I doubt whether we can do that much on taxation in four or five years. We can do better. Hopefully we will do better as, I mean, the GST gets over its uh, initial uh, 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 teething problems. There are some obvious reforms that can, but you know, these reforms must be announced and seen. Hmm. Uh, and uh, I mean, we're ready for them, but you have to do something. Even so, it's very unlikely that the tax to GDP ratio, the center and states put together, will go up by more than three percentage points of GDP in four years. That, by the way, would be an outstanding performance. Hmm. So, what do we do about the other seven percent? That requires you to handle what are the expenditures you're going to cut. Hmm. There is absolutely no debate on this. And I don't blame the government. There isn't any willingness on the part of any group to tolerate any cut in any expenditure. I mean, the finance minister has one of the toughest jobs in the world because she's more or less under notice from every 
a comm commentariat person that don't cut good expenditure. And everybody's view of all these good expenditures includes virtually all the subsidies that are being given. Everyone's in favor of cutting subsidies in general, but identify the subsidy concern that nobody's, in, nobody's willing to stand up and say we should get rid of this. So that's, you know, so it's not easy is what I'm saying. So if you were to orchestrate a fiscal turnaround plan and create this 10% uh, leap, what will be the constituents of that? That's a good, uh, I, I mean, it's very, I've thought about this. Constituent number one is to completely debunk the secrecy of the budget. Mm -hmm. Intelligent discussion on the budget in India cannot take place in an environment in which the finance ministry is traditionally required to be maintain secrecy. Hmm. I mean, from October onwards, no worthwhile to and fro discussion takes place. Because what happens is that we were the same. I mean, the, we used to have these people yeah. would come and give us advice and we never responded. So they loved the fact that we were calling them in and they got to meet the finance minister and so on. And then they would go outside and say, humne to keh diya. Hmm. But if you ask them, what did the finance ministry say? They would say, no, they didn't say anything. Right. So really between October and the presentation of the budget, uh, useful exchange of views stops. Hmm. I think we should just get rid of it. Quite hmm. frankly, I think the ministry, it would be a good idea for the ministry in my view. Hmm. Now, or maybe they should have done that a month ago, to announce some thoughts about tax reform. That, Preferably, that, in my view, coming from an expert committee. Because otherwise, you get politically attacked. But if you put up an expert committee and say, look, this is what they're saying, and let the, let the people attack those, those experts, then you have a debate on these things. I mean, look at the discussion on the ravery issue. Uh, you know, um, it, it goes to the heart of the question, hmm. uh, what is a good expenditure and what is not? Hmm. Uh, I have said uh, somewhere that I think the reversal to the old pension scheme hmm. is a bad idea by the states. I mean, the center hasn't said it's going to do that. It's a bad idea. Hmm. But still, some states have done it. Hmm. And I fear that, you know, if this is seen to be the way to go, every state may end up doing it. Hmm. And somebody fiscally should be asked to project what does this mean? 10 years down the road. So, I mean, these kinds of, to have an intelligent political debate on this, we need much more political education. I mean, or rather education of the political participants. Hmm. And that's not there. See, today, the position is one that if you become finance minister tomorrow, and you get up in parliament and announce an expenditure, of 150,000 crores on something which looks good. Hmm. You know, education of women, health, whatever. You will be applauded. Hmm. Nobody will ask you, where's the money coming from? Hmm. And in no country can you have intelligent fiscal uh, development unless the political consciousness in parliament and outside addresses that question, where's the money coming from? Now, it makes a lot of sense, by the way, to say, you know, the money is going to come from growth. Because you fellows have been stuck at 6%, I'm going to grow the economy at 9%. Right. And then somebody will ask, so what are you going to do for that? Mm. And then you say A, B, and C. Mm. And they will look at A, B, and C. The debate will have improved. Because, you know, if you aim at 9%, and year after year you don't get it, somebody will say, listen, it's not working. But we need, we need that kind of... Uh, I guess that plan is already there in terms of, at least in, in, the, in, in terms of narrative, that the way to get to 8% plus growth is this PLI scheme which we are relying on, which will sort of resurrect manufacturing. So that's my question. Do you believe this PLI scheme will really uh, change the complexion of Indian manufacturing and contribute to growth significantly that can alter uh, the trajectory from what we have seen over the last well, 10, 15 years? Well, <clears throat> a couple of questions, a couple of points here. First, I don't think anyone uh, believes that the PLI scheme is going to get you from 6% GDP growth to 8% GDP growth. PLI will only help manufacturing. Right. Many people believe manufacturing is very important, and that's fine. But the PLI is a very much more limited scheme. 
what is going to get GDP growing at six from six to eight hmm. percent is a whole lot of things, including development of infrastructure, improvement of logistics. Uh, I can go on and on. Yeah. That's going to require investment, more public, more private investment, and so on. And it requires adaptation to the dangers posed by climate change, which are now becoming very evident. Okay, so to say that we're going to get to eight to nine percent growth through PLI, I think is not fair. Hmm. Okay, now let me ask you answer your question on PLI. What do I think about? It? You know, I think the origin of the PLI scheme was the perception that Indian industry is not able to compete uh, and therefore it needs some special support. Right. I would not have picked on the PLI as the most important thing to do because you know until very recently the reason why Indian industry was not able to compete used to be A that our infrastructure is bad B, that our procedures are bad, C, that our logistics is poor, and many people said that our exchange rate is appreciated. Right. And if you address these questions, lots of things would happen. Okay? The PLI operates in a totally different plane. Hmm. Uh, each of these things that I've mentioned would affect industry, not only industry, but all uh, sectors, but as far as industry is concerned, all industry together. Hmm. The PLI affects a handful of industries which don't actually account for that larger proportion of manufacturing anyway. Okay? But I think the two different kinds of PLI uh, concepts that are floating around. One is uh, what is strictly the PLI, which is an identification of certain sectors and saying, look, we're going to give you a subsidy hmm. If you, for a certain number of years, if you increase your production uh, in these sectors at the rate of whatever it is, 5% or 6% or 7% of the increase, okay? You know, my feeling is that subsidy schemes uh, always based on a judgment that somehow this sector needs a subsidy uh, and it's, we've chosen a sector which if given a subsidy, it'll expand rapidly. Right. I don't know the quality of the input in choosing these so-called winners, basically. Hmm. If you look at the global scene, you know, one theme that is really coming across very strongly is economic nationalism, where most countries are more inward focused. Do you believe India is also becoming more protectionist uh, in terms of policy? And what does it mean uh, in terms of implications? Well, uh, you're absolutely right that there is a global trend which is increasing a sort of a nationalistic uh, perception on economic policy. Uh, people distancing themselves from China, not trusting supply chains which are located too far away and so on. Uh, and you know, all fashions uh, spread and uh, that fashion is also spread in India. Uh, Am I worried about whether we are becoming too protectionist? The short answer is yes. And the reason for this is the following. Although the rest, the rest of the world has been phenomenally open, okay, and is now becoming a little more closed, we generally have been phenomenally closed and we became a lot more open. But the present position is we are much less open than other countries. So I still remain of the view that even if the rest of the world is closing, for India, we probably need to continue to open and integrate, rather than to say, okay, uh, the mantra of open economies is over and we should now close down. As a matter of fact, if we were to do that, it would be a disastrous outcome. And certainly in my view, the transition to 8% growth is not going to be possible unless we retain this sensible view that India needs to continue to open and integrate. Now this is a controversial position and I wish it were debated more. Hmm. <clears throat> and I think um, in your other shows you should ask uh, the same question of other observers and trigger a bit of a debate on it. Now let's look at it this way. We are in one sense favorably placed in India because we're in Asia 
which of all the continents is going to do the best in the coming years? Certainly much better than Africa, much better than Latin America, much better than America and Europe. We are therefore in a part of the world which is A as a whole going to perform better and where the until now star performer China is slowing down. That's, that would have happened anyway. But not only slowing down, but it's, it's facing suspicion. So apart from the slowdown, people want to diversify away from China. Nothing wrong with that because I think they were a bit too dependent on China. India should position itself to say, look, uh, we're still there. We may not, we're not as large as China by any means. But if you're going to diversify, this is the place you should come to. The problem with that is most people would say that, look, we were, I, we were earlier going to China, which was hugely open in one sense. We want to go to a country that is also hugely open. And we are not hugely open. I mean, they will say that, look, uh, is India as open as, let's say, East Asia or Southeast Asia? And the answer is we're not. So we need to be more open. And this is something that needs to be put up front loud and clear in the economic debate. And there are different views on it. So you asked me to ask other people about the other side of the debate. Now I'm going to ask you to argue the other side of the debate. Uh, how would it, if you were to argue that uh, for the other side, what would it be? And I'll tell you where I'm coming from. You know, for a good part of this decade, and from the 90s, you know, when China had what we have as an opportunity today, I mean, they played the whole game by their own rules. They decided where to open. They did, decided how they will go about uh, the currency. All of it was very strategically thought through to ensure that uh, that they would play the game exactly on their terms because they understood that that is where the huge demographic was, that is where the good, you know, mm -hmm. huge growth opportunity lied. Today, if we were to assume that, you know, China has played its game, now we are the next best uh, growing economy and we could really uh, set the terms uh, as it suits us. What is wrong with that no, kind no, of thinking? No, no, hundred percent. That's what we should do. The question is, what suits us? The Chinese didn't simply uh, sort of uh, do something because they thought it was Chinese. The Chinese, yes, they didn't. They didn't bring in democracy, by the way. That's very hmm. clear. Hmm. Hmm. I think the Americans, in my view, wrongly thought that by trade opening, China would also become more democratic. Which didn't happen. This was not only really incorrect judgment then. No Chinese ever said so, and I think it's clearly wrong. Hmm. But what did the Chinese do in terms of economics? Hmm. They built the best infrastructure that anyone can think of, okay? Uh, which meant that any Chinese person interested in production could actually get things from A to B faster than anyone else. They put in place uh, logistical procedures which actually helped Chinese companies that wanted to deal with the rest of the world. They did that not by opening up all of China, but by setting up these special economic zones. Hmm. Nothing stops us from doing that. Actually, there was some talk about it. We hmm. were supposed hmm. to be having these zones. I don't know what's happened. Uh, but certainly, if we were to go that route, it makes, in my view, a lot of sense. Okay? They recognize that initially, uh, their skill is going to lie in manufactured, simple manufactured goods, which are labor intensive. So they encouraged the exploitation of Chinese surplus labor by bringing them into manufacturing. None of, no labor standard concerns, no unionism, nothing. Now, we have been exactly the opposite. Oh. I mean, less than 10% of Indian labor is in the formal sector. Oh. And of that, about half may be in the unionized sector. Our entire labor legislation is based on some ridiculous assumption that these regulations actually help Indian labor. And as a result, uh, employment in exports have shot up in China and not shot up in India. Hmm. And now it's happening in Bangladesh and Vietnam. So I think, you know, it's not that it's our turn, we have to do our thing. Hmm. It's our turn, yes, but we have to learn what works. I don't believe, by the way, that 
anyone in India would say, let's give up democracy, okay? If somebody did, it, it, they would just get rejected, okay? <coughs> so that's the one Chinese thing which I don't hear anyone say, and I think they're right. But everything else the Chinese did is what made it possible for them to become competitive, and we should take a lesson from that. And that is what we should do. And now sure. These are the things we've discussed before. I think the, unfortunately, I mean, you mentioned the exchange rate, okay? The Chinese systematically undervalued the exchange rate. Yeah. For years, their incredible export success was blamed on undervaluing the exchange rate. The rupee has appreciated in real terms. There is some very unfortunate kind of commentary that the rupee is depreciating. Oh. Right now, the rupee is depreciated much less than other currencies. And it could be argued that in the last seven or eight years, if we had depreciated the exchange rate a little bit more, say 5%, huh. a lot of the increases in import duties that we've had to, that we've, in my view, unfortunately introduced, would not be necessary. Huh. So those are the lessons from China, which I hope somebody will put across. So you do believe this conversation around rupee depreciation is political theater? Well, I don't know if it's political theater, but it's economically wrong. I mean, anybody who says that the rupee depreciation uh, and implies that the rupee should not have depreciated doesn't realize that actually the rupee has appreciated against the euro, it's appreciated against the yen, it's appreciated against a lot of other currencies. And for a country that's running a current account deficit, hmm. uh, that is an absurd outcome. Hmm. So I don't share the view that uh, the rupee depreciation, whatever has happened, is actually less than what could be justified if you followed the policy uh, of stabilizing the real effective exchange rate. Sure. Do you think there is a way for us to benefit or leverage the current geopolitical situation? Can we emerge winners from this? Well, I mean, uh, I'm not an expert on the geopolitical situation, but I think I think what's happening is very clear. Uh, we, we recognize that um, the world has changed. I mean, the old, uh, the old certainties of a, of a kind of a multipolar world uh, working towards a common goal with a great deal of willingness of countries to cooperate, that has actually disappeared. Hmm. Uh, hopefully it'll come back, but it, it certainly evaporated a fair amount. Okay? Uh, in that situation, what do we do? Well, one, we should not be hung up uh, on uh, a particular position because this is what we've done in the past. So we should be flexible. I think we are being flexible. Uh, on the Russia-Ukraine crisis, for example, that's a very sad outcome with a lot of pain currently being inflicted on, uh, on Ukraine. And of course, we had our historical ties yeah. with Russia. But I think we made it plain that, look, uh, the, the Russians need to adopt a different approach. Now, I'm not speaking, by, by the way, for the government, but yeah. I, obviously. Uh, but I think the general perception that has come across is that while we don't want to condemn the Russians, and we don't want to join a political move which is simply pointing fingers, we are saying, that war is not a solution, that they should go back to negotiation, etc., etc., etc. I think that's not an unreasonable position to take. We're recognizing that we have tensions with China. Uh, what's going on on the border is a sort of eye-opener that we have a problem there. Let's hope it doesn't uh, accelerate. Gonna... But, you know, the move to join the Quad, for example, to my mind is quite a logical exploration of flexibility. We're now doing things which 10 years ago we wouldn't have done, all sorts of military exercises. I think that's a signal which makes sense. What I'm not so happy about is that the Quad also has a trade pillar, huh. which is not a very clearly defined pillar. Huh. But for some reason, we are not a member of it. And I think this is a mistake. I mean, in my view, uh, I know that people may feel that we shouldn't join a free trade agreement, huh. but this is only a discussion stage not to join, uh, to join the Quad hmm. on the grounds that these are like-minded countries, which means we don't have any very basic disagreements with them, and to 
not join the trade pillar at a time when we want to integrate with this part of the world, I find difficult to explain. Uh, whether we end up joining a free trade agreement or not is a decision that be, can be taken later. But joining the pillar enables us to let people know what our concerns are and to engage in a discussion. I think sure. we should be part of it. Back to economic growth. One of the reasons we've really seen buoyant economic growth, if at all we may say so, and some tax buoyancy is because of the formalization of the economy. Now, do you think the benefits of formalization is already established into a new normal or do we have some more uh, uh, room to run? You know, when you say uh, <clears throat> we've seen economic growth, etc., uh, what we've actually seen, uh, if you're looking at, let's say, if you, if you look at the, the, let's say, the current government from 2014 onwards, then in the first three or four, three years, there was an uptick of growth, it almost got, got back to two years of 8%, and then it steadily declined. Right. I think you have to separate the pandemic. Hmm. The pandemic was an exceptional event not just for India, but the whole world, okay? So if you just look at what happened to growth before the pandemic, hmm. uh, it rose and then fell. So why it fell is a matter that we need to seriously think about. We were not on a high growth trajectory before the pandemic hit. Now, when the pandemic hit, of course, our growth went down, yeah. probably more than many other countries. That you can't blame uh, on the government because it was a pandemic and so on. After that, the growth went up Correct. more than for other countries. But that's not a revival of growth. That's just the other side of having gone down more. So I would disregard uh, the last year uh, as anything other than getting back to square one. So the present position in my view is that we are right now not all sectors. I mean, for example, airlines are still not back hmm. to where they were in 2019-20. In but most sectors have kind of gone back. back to that level in the, in, in the year 2023, 22-23. And some are actually positive above, above the 2019-20 uh, level. So this is the right time to ask the question, are we poised for future growth? Hmm. Many people think that because we are going to grow somewhere just below 7% in the current year, that we are poised for just below 7% growth for the future. This would be a little over optimistic because even this year's growth is raised by the first quarter's growth being very high because we hadn't got yes. over uh, the depressed effect. So really, it's the growth rate you expect in the second half of 22-23, which might give you a sense of what the underlying growth is. And that's not much more than 5%. Hmm. So the challenge we face now is, are we now poised for 5% growth, or can we get to something better? That's an open question, and it, it depends on what we do. To some extent, it also depends on the world economy. Because, you know, if the world economy slows down, which most people think it will next year, in 2023, it would be that much more difficult for India to become bouncy. Sure. So, in terms of tax buoyancy, there were three contributors to uh, buoyancy this year, I feel. One is the pent-up demand and therefore higher output. Second is the nominal terms GDP grew much faster because of inflation. And the third part is the compliance uh, impact. In your mind, what is the pecking order of these uh, three that's things? A tough, that's, a good, that's a very good question, but a very tough question. But let's be clear about one thing. What you're calling tax buoyancy includes the recovery period. Hmm. I mean, the tax, tax rate as a percent of GDP hmm. is not that much higher than it was in 2019-20. So you need to look at buoyancy taking out the effect of the pandemic. The second thing is that if you're looking at the budget hmm. for the current year, you know, the finance ministry had made the projection of the budget as if it was going to be an 11% nominal growth of GDP. Hmm. But you know, inflation has been much higher. Hmm. Uh, so as a matter of fact, some of what you see as buoyancy in revenues hmm. reflects buoyancy because of higher inflation. Yeah. 
the GDP numbers when they come out will also reflect that inflation. So the real test of buoyancy is, is the, is the tax ratio as a percent of GDP higher? Hmm. It may well be higher than 21, 22, yeah. because that was, that was part of the pandemic depression. You need to compare it with 2019-20. Uh, Those numbers are not available. Maybe it'll be a little bit higher. Hmm. But to say that tax, we are now seeing tax buoyancy, I mean, would be premature. So, so what rate would you expect for next year? Because clearly, because of the base effect, because of, you know, uh, inflation. I mean, I, getting, uh, this is, would you hazard a, a guess? It's a mug's game to project a year ahead even if you're in the government, but to do it when you're not in the government is really being far too risky. I don't know, to be honest. But it would not be unreasonable to think that, you know, the uh, elasticity of taxation with respect to nominal GDP would be around a little over 1%, which is what it has been historically. Okay. So then the question is, what do you expect as growth? Yeah. And what do you expect as inflation? I think on inflation, we seem to be coming down, uh, and maybe that will continue, uh, because I think the global inflation effect will also have disappeared. Growth rate, uh, as I said, uh, when we have the data for the last two quarters of the current year, depending on policy, we can make a projection for the future. But you know, internationally, most people expect the world as a whole to grow slower Hmm. next year than this year yeah. and they also expect India to do the same. So if India's growth this year is, I don't know, 6.9, 6.8, whatever, then maybe next year the best we can do is 6.5. So they should make a budget making all these things plain. The problem with our budget process is that we never make the real growth rate plain. Hmm. We only talk about nominal growth hmm. and nominal growth without knowing what the inflation target yeah. is, cannot be linked to real growth. So there's a lot of, uh, that's what journalists are supposed to educate people about, and I'm sure you will. Absolutely, absolutely, and we are. So um, the other question is, uh, how do you see, uh, do you see any weak spots or cracks in the economy that have got camouflaged this year? We keep talking yeah. about this K-shaped recovery. Is that sustainable? Well, the K-shaped recovery is a very important uh, feature because, you know, I think uh, uh, for a long time, uh, even before uh, this government uh, came into power, there was a perception that, you know, uh, uh, the lower, lower parts of the income spectrum, yeah. you know, while they were growing, they were not growing as rapidly as the middle and top part, okay? What the pandemic has done is even the middle part has been badly hurt. Uh, I think that Formalization, well, people talk about digitization, people talk about, I mean, the demonetization, they talk about the GST and what it has done to small industries and the more general uh, uh, process of digitalization which is going on. So I, th I would hope that all of this leads to more formalization of the economy. That was the objective. Hmm. And I think it's happening, hmm. uh, maybe not as fast as it should, but it is happening. And hopefully more of this will happen. That will certainly help tax buoyancy. Hmm. Because what's going to happen is a lot of the smaller and middle enterprises were earlier actually prospering because of uh, uh, capturing a tax loophole. Hmm. They were able not to pay taxes. What formalization will do, and particularly the GST and the cross-referencing from what your sales are to what your income tax is, et cetera. It will make it, companies that comply uh, with, uh, with, with, with the tax system will end up doing better. Okay? Mm. Uh, this will push a lot of other businesses out of business. Yes. And we must recognize that. Yeah. That doesn't mean, by the way, that employment will go down. It just means that the businesses that comply will expand and they will absorb labor and those that don't comply may actually contract and therefore lose labor and lose employment. So how fast this process will take is very difficult to judge, but it will definitely be happening. Uh, and therefore one should assume over the next two or three years that some of this is going on and it's a good thing.
But I can't quantify next year whether it will be very significant or not. And do you see any cracks in the economy or any weak spots that we should be cognizant that, of? That yeah, this time? you mentioned that, and I should have answered. That's a tough question, so I kind of subtly avoided it. What are the weak spots? Well, I, I'll tell you my uh, uh, concerns. Number one, I think we need clarity now on where are we heading on the fiscal deficit. Hmm. If it is the political judgment that we cannot reduce the fiscal deficit in the next two years on any significant scale, I think we are better off saying so. Hmm. It would not be a good idea to pretend that we are reducing it because what happens is when you pretend you're reducing it at the end of the year, people always say that, well, look, you know, you just didn't do what you were. Oh. So I think number one, a weak spot, are we going to come clean on what's going to happen on the fiscal deficit in the center? And linked to that, how much borrowing are we going to allow the states? Because, you know, the states cannot run a fiscal deficit hmm. unless the center allows them to borrow. Hmm. So if you're going to be tough, let's just say, Hmm. that we believe that you know this is going to be the central deficit this is the borrowing allowed to say combined deficit will go down from a to b whatever hmm. it is two i think we need to get the insolvency and bankruptcy code back in operation it got interrupted because of the pandemic it got derailed uh, most people feel that you know we need to get it back so that the signal given to those who borrow from banks that actually you do have to repay these loans. Hmm. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of balance sheet cleaning up that still has to be done because, you know, many of the mudra loans that were given, I mean, I don't know how many of them will turn NPA. Now, they're not classifying them as NPA at the moment because hmm. of the pandemic. But we must give a clear signal that, like, the pandemic is now over, so we get back uh, on track in that. Three, you know, I feel that uh, a low-hanging fruit is uh, what are we willing to do to improve the conditions of operation of the banking system. I think there's too much focus on whether we're going to privatize two public sector banks. It's a right. good thing to do, and let's try to do it. But the fact is, it's going to be very complicated. Hmm. It's much more important to ask the question, are we making the rest of the public sector banking system, which is actually 60% of the banking system, hmm. are we making it easier for them to become efficient? Hmm. Now, my favorite recommendation in this area is the implementation of the PJ Nayak committee report, hmm. which had said, get rid of dual control right. and let the public sector banks know that they're going to be under the regulatory control only of the Reserve Bank of India. Correct. Not the finance ministry. Right. Now, this recommendation was made way back in 1991 by the, not by the uh, Narasimham committee, but by a note uh, put forward by two members of the Narasimham committee. Of course, uh, when we were in government, we were not able to do this. And there wasn't that at that time why were you not able to do this? Well, it was premature. I mean, in the sense that, look, at that time, the public sector banking system was whatever, 80% of the total. And our preoccupation then was, look, let's get the private sector banking system, give them flexibility, let them show that they can actually do something. And I think we, were, we meaning several governments, were successful in that. And today you've got a situation where the private sector banking system has expanded quite a bit. And what is more, its NPAs are much lower than the public sector banking system, okay? So I think we're now in a position where we now need to look at, okay, that's happening, that will happen. These banks will, uh, will be expanding and thanks to fintech and, you know, technology and so on, uh, they're, they're going to take the ball and run. Now, are we going to just let the public sector bank be crippled by excessive control, bureaucratic interference, etc., or are we going to free them? To my mind, it's far more important to free the State Bank of India, which is a fine bank and which can really compete with some right. of these private sector banks, free them from any control from the finance ministry. I'm not saying, by the way, from any control from the Reserve Bank of India. Yeah. But dual control is, in my view, an abomination. 
and the time has come to get rid of it. I would say, by the way, that if that were decided, it would be the single most important signal we could give. But I mean, it's been, the NIAC committee made its recommendation in 2015, that is seven years ago, now eight. So the question is, are we going to do that or not? Back to fiscal deficit, um, you know, the target for this year is 6.4. And in about three years, we are supposed to reach 4.5, at least, at least that is what the finance minister has said. And so for this year, considering that we are still, you know, the growth, uh, there are so many global uncertainties, how would you like the finance minister to really uh, prioritize? Do you think she'll have to adhere to this fiscal discipline? Uh, or will sh would, you, would you say that uh, we should be prioritizing growth more? I, you know, this, the notion that prioritizing growth means uh, ignoring the fiscal deficit is, I think, a bit of a mistake. Yeah. Uh, I have never said that in order to get growth, you need to run a bigger fiscal deficit. I've given a number of things that we need to do in order to run growth. I would say we shouldn't be raising import duties. I think if we are willing to reverse that, that would be a good thing. We should try to join organizations like the RCEP, we should complete the free trade agreement with the UK and with, uh, with the US, uh, with the EU. Uh, we should join the trade pillar of uh, the Quad. Uh, we should uh, get rid of dual control uh, of the public sector banks. This is what will give us growth. Uh, fiscal deficit is important, but you know, fine tuning it. Whether, uh, for example, if she were to do all these things and say, the fiscal deficit is going to be exactly what it is today, I would applaud. I mean, that's what we should look at. This fine tuning of the fiscal deficit, I mean, I'm not trying to negate. Hmm. Uh, and certainly if she ends up having a bigger fiscal deficit, that'll be very bad. Right. But how fast she reduces it is not, I think, the most important thing at this moment. So what is the one thing you are, um, you would wait for in the budget personally? No, I, I'm not. I mean, I just hope that nothing wrong is done. I don't share this view that what is said in the budget makes a huge difference. Let me, let me go back to uh, 1991. Uh, and I've said this in my book Backstage, which I don't know if you've read, but let me put in an author's plea that you right. read it. You know, uh, the 1991 budget speech of Dr. Manmohan Singh is very often regarded as a watershed moment. Actually, it was a watershed speech, but it wasn't a watershed moment because the most important policy changes which constituted 1991 had already been announced. The devaluation was done before the budget. The trade policy changes with which I was involved, Mr. Chidambaram was then the trade minister, I was commissary, that was also announced before the budget. Yeah. Uh, the industrial policy had been announced five yeah. hours before the budget. So frankly, the budget speech went to the public and said, look, we were in a crisis. We've done all these things. Right. And now I'm giving you the reason why we are doing it. Right. Since then, budget speeches have been converted into something that's going to announce uh, policy change. I think policy changes should be made independent of budget speeches. Sure. And the best budget speech would be one which says, you've already heard the policies we are going to follow. Here are the numbers that have to be fitted into the budget. And then the rather matter of fact presentation of revenues and expenditures. Sure. That's what we should do. Sure. By the way, if we get that, I think it will be a real breakthrough. Sure. Thank you so much, Mr. Aluwalia. It was such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thanks. Much. I